The book of Revelation is a book that has fascinated and mystified Christians for generations. And, and frankly speaking, Revelation is a tough book to read. When we open the pages and we see some of the dramatic and strange symbols and visions, it is really easy to say, I don't know what I'm getting into. I don't know what any of this means. And I hope that someone can explain this to me. Part of that is because Revelation is a part of a genre of literature, a style of writing that is known as apocalyptic literature. And we simply just don't know how to read that very well. We need some training, we need some help. And because Christians have been engaging this book at different moments in history, there's been different approaches and how to understand this book. In biblical studies, we call this hermeneutics. It's the science of interpretation. And regarding the book of Revelation, there's essentially four different hermeneutic models, four interpretive models that throughout the story of Christian history, Christians have used as a lens to approach and to understand this book. So let's go through all four of those one by one. The first is an approach known as historicism. Essentially, historicism views the book of Revelation as telling a linear chronological progression of the entire history of the church from the beginning of the apostolic era into the church fathers, into the medieval era, and so on and so forth. This is an approach that actually a lot of the Protestant reformers, guys like Martin Luther and John Calvin, really privileged and prioritized. So, for example, they would have seen something like the four horsemen of the apocalypse as describing symbolically different moments of early church history. Um, the persecutions, for example, that happened in the first three centuries of the church. They would have seen their own historical moment as Protestant reformers that were trying to come up against the great beast of the sea and the beast of the land that they interpreted as both the governmental and the religious power of the Catholic Church at the time. This approach really isn't as popular anymore. And that's because a lot of times History keeps moving forward and the story keeps changing. Um, it's really hard to be very consistent with which historical event you associate with each vision of Revelation. Another historical approach that, that privileges history is the second approach called preterism. Now, preterism is interesting because it really focuses on the first century and the culture and the events of the first century. A lot of the events that would have been directly impacting the apostles themselves, as well as the early Christian communities. The thing that's unique about preterism is essentially it would believe that everything that happens in Revelation already happened in the first century. A lot of preterism focuses on what's called the first Jewish Roman war. Ultimately, it's a rebellion begun by the Jews in AD 66, and it culminates in the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem in the year AD 70. Full-blown preterists would actually believe that everything that is written down in Revelation happened and has already happened then. And so even the return of Christ, even the final judgment, would be viewed as something that was completed when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. Um, because of this, um, the view that's more popular today is what's known as partial preterism, which again still believes that most of Revelation is really referring to events that happened in the first century, but that we're still awaiting Christ's return, and that Revelation still does um, deal with and talk about uh, the events of Christ's second return. The third view, which is probably the most popular view right now, is a view that's known as futurism. So it's almost the exact opposite of uh, historicism and preterism. It essentially views that the majority of Revelation, the majority of the great apocalyptic visions that are so popular in this book, are describing events that happen at the very end of time, at the very end of human history. This view initially was developed by some of the Roman Catholic Jesuits that were trying to counter some of the Protestant interpretations of Revelation that were more historicist in nature. And they wanted to say, no, the Revelation is dealing with future events. The version of futurism that is probably the most familiar to you and that most people are familiar with today is something that's known as dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a broad framework of how to understand the Bible. It deals with subjects like how to understand the relationship with Israel and the church. But particularly as it's related to Revelation, it sees most of Revelation, everything basically happening from chapter four on, as something that is happening at the very, very conclusion of human history. 
that we're supposed to see um, certain events um, really as events that are coordinated with the final seven years of human history. Oftentimes you'll hear terms like the seven years of tribulation, um, the rapture of the church. Um, oftentimes uh, dispensationalists will talk about a one world government or the identity of a future antichrist that might be essentially Satan in the flesh. This is a view that was really popularized by the Left Behind novel series. And so it's very much lodged into the American evangelical imagination. It's the view that I honestly thought was the only view as I grew up and I would hear Revelation talked about. Um, as I've gone on, I, I've started to see a lot of problems um, with dispensationalism, so much so that it's no longer a view that I would uphold. Um, essentially, I think the biggest problem is that it gives you a framework that you then impose on the book of Revelation rather than um, looking at the book of Revelation and drawing those ideas from the text itself. Um, and so, for example, a lot of people are shocked to hear that words like the seven years of tribulation, um, even the word antichrist is not a word that appears in the book of Revelation, but you can kind of impose some of those ideas onto the book. Um, dispensationalists will oftentimes say that they have a more literal approach of the Bible and an understanding of the Bible. Um, but the problem with that is that sometimes they take things symbolically and sometimes they don't. And there's really not a consistent measure for how they do that. And so they'll see the two witnesses of Revelation 11 as literal figures that will be preaching God's word in Jerusalem at the end of time. Um, but the beasts that you see in Revelation chapter 13 rising out of the ocean with multiple heads, of course, that's something that we take symbolically. And again, there's not really a consistent way um, to interpret it. The view, just laying all my cards on the table that I most favor, is an interpretive mode that is known as idealism. And what I like about idealism is that it presumes that Revelation is a book, it's a message, it's a part of scripture that is not just relevant to us, but it's relevant to all Christians of all ages. Um, so again, kind of the problem with preterism is that really all the events of Revelation are only relevant to the Christians of the first century. The problem with futurism is that all of the events of Revelation or the majority of events of Revelation are only relevant to the Christians or the people of God that are ending at the very end of time. And I think that Revelation is God's word that's always relevant. It's relevant now. It's a book of apocalyptic literature that does use these fantastic symbols, but it's meant to uncover, it's meant to unveil spiritual truth that Christians of all ages are to see. In fact, I believe it's something that unveils all of history, past, present, and future in light of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll give you an example. In other frameworks, the four horsemen of the apocalypse might be coordinated with specific figures in history. This one might be Napoleon, this one might be Hitler, this one might be this particular world war or an event. But in idealism, we look at the four horsemen of the apocalypse, conquest and bloodshed and war, famine, and death, and we say, actually, this is the story of human history. This is the story of a sin fractured humanity, a creation that is groaning for redemption. And we see those four horsemen riding throughout all of history. In that way, the message of Revelation really is universal. It's something for all Christians all the time. Now, I want to be real clear to say that regarding these approaches, I think we should be okay with Christians agreeing to disagree. Um, for really the whole history of the church, Christians have disagreed on how to interpret Revelation the right way. But there are some big ideas that we should take from Revelation that we should all agree on. And this is what we would call in theology, the doctrine of eschatology, the doctrine about the end of time. The one thing that all Christians should agree on is that Jesus is coming back. That there's a day that Jesus is returning, that he's going to come back and make all things new, that sin and death will be vanquished, that every tear will be wiped away from every eye. And that truth is something that we should cling to because it gives us hope. Hope in tribulation, hope when we experience despair and loss, hope when we even come face to face with death itself. But Revelation also shows us that there is a God who stands at the end of history who will hold all evil to account. That God's justice, his judgment are coming. And that this is a good thing because it means that there's a day that, that evil will be ended. But it also should inspire us to be people who live holy lives 
lives that bring honor to the name of Jesus. Now, we're not going to be perfect, but we should at least aim to be a humble and holy people that when we stumble, we stumble towards Jesus, not away from him. Lastly, Revelation shows us that there is a definite end of human history. And that should inspire us to reach out to people who don't yet know Jesus, to bear testimony to the gospel and witness to what Jesus has done in our own lives so that people who do not yet know Jesus would come to know him and love him and worship him. It should inspire us to approach our evangelistic task with a sense of holy urgency. And I think that as we look into Revelation, we shouldn't be afraid of it. It's definitely not a book that should inspire fear. It's a book that should inspire hope. It's not a book that should also inspire us to speculate endlessly about end of the world scenarios and trying to play a game of guess who um, about the Antichrist. I really think it's a book that is primarily designed to give us unveiled eyes, to give us a reformed imagination to understand who we are in this world and to be disciples of Jesus, to be a people who are faithful to the way of the Lamb who was slain in a world that is so oftentimes filled with dragons and beasts. At the end of the day, it's not a book that is primarily about the revelation of the end of time. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so I hope that you want to study more about Revelation, learn more about Revelation. Right now at Redeemer Christian Church, we're preaching through the book of Revelation. If you're interested in seeing how we've approached some of these mysterious texts, I encourage you to go online at RedeemerChristianChurch.com or check out our podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, um, as well as YouTube. But whatever the case, I hope that Revelation is a book that can bless you, a book that you're not afraid of, but a book that inspires you um, to faithfully follow Jesus in the present age.